Well, good morning again. I've actually been away on holidays the last couple of weeks, so great to be back. You know, it was, it, was, it was near the beach, so I can imagine myself back there on that sort of beach uh, uh, again. But I am really excited for Philemon this morning. This is a great little letter, and I kind of like to think of Philemon as a, a kind of like a, a spin-off TV show to Colossians. Right, we've just finished Colossians over the past term, and Philemon is certainly related to it, but its, it's own thing is coming on. So think of it like the spin-off TV show to the, to the letter to the Colossians. Uh, let me pray and we will get into it. Our Father, fill us this morning with a knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that we might walk worthy of Jesus, fully pleasing to him, growing and bearing fruit in every good work. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me tell you a story. This is a story about a rather well-to-do citizen who lived in Colossae, right? And he lives in Colossae around the same time, uh, or at the same time, that Paul is writing his letter to the Colossian church. Now, this citizen's name, Philemon. A number of years earlier, Philemon, he'd actually travelled across to the city of Ephesus, perhaps as a business trip, and like many others in Ephesus... Philemon hears Paul preaching about this Jesus Christ and what he's done at the cross and what he offers anyone who believes. And right there and then, Philemon becomes a follower of Jesus. Now, about the same time, uh, another citizen of Colossae also comes to uh, Ephesus. His name is Epaphras. He has a similar experience. And these two men, Epaphras and Philemon, they then take the gospel back to their hometown of Colossae, where a a group of people, they start gathering uh, and under Philemon's house, under Philemon's roof. And so the Colossian church is born. Now, one member of Philemon's household is a slave named Onesimus. And it must have been a strange thing for this uh, Onesimus, seeing kind of all sorts of things going on here. People, strange people, different kind of background people are coming to his master's house, to Philemon's house, and they're talking and they're singing about this risen Savior. It must have been a strange thing indeed for Onesimus to see. Uh, Nevertheless, at some point later on, for one reason or another, this slave Onesimus runs away. He legs it. Time passes on. Paul is no longer in Ephesus. He's now actually imprisoned in Rome. And uh, he's imprisoned because he's been declaring the gospel. Now, that doesn't stop him whatsoever. He just keeps preaching it boldly with whoever comes his way. And it just so happens... Someone that did come his way was this runaway slave, Onesimus. And so he too, through Paul, gives his life to Christ. And his deep affection grows between Paul and Onesimus. And, well, Onesimus assists Paul and partners with him in his ministry in a bunch of ways. Then a little while later on, Paul, he receives this wonderfully encouraging update on how that Colossian church is going, uh, meeting there back in Philemon's house. And so Paul, he writes the letter to the Colossians, that letter we've just worked our way through over the past uh, nine or so weeks. But here's the question, what is to be done with Onesimus, Philemon's Slave that has run away, Onesimus, who has now come to Christ, for Onesimus, who has been assisting him at Paul's side, what is to be done with him? And so Paul, he writes this short letter that we know as Philemon, he writes this short letter, sends it back with Tychicus, his messenger, and he also sends back Onesimus. And you can imagine, can't you, that as the letter to the Colossians has been finished, uh, read out, Tychicus may have said something like this. Now, friends, I do have another letter to read to you from Paul that Paul wants all of you to hear. It's short, but it's important. And I can imagine, like everybody, they're, they're looking at each other inquisitively Like, what's going on here? What's to be said? Maybe Anisimus at this point sort of steps out. He was behind the curtain of that part, I don't know. But Tychicus begins to read it out. This is what he writes in verse 1. This is what Paul writes. 
Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. To Aphia, our sister, who quite possibly is Philemon's wife. To Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. So you see, yes, this is for Philemon, but it is also for the whole church to hear. It concerns everyone. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before going on any further, uh, you might be thinking, wait, (laughs) here's Philemon, he's a Christian, but he's also a a master of slaves. He he has slaves. Well, how does that work? Is that, what's, that's not a fair go, is it? Well, let me just say a few quick things about slavery to help us understand this little letter. Uh, Firstly, it's this, the number one priority for Paul and the other New Testament writers was this, it's the spread of the gospel. That's their number one priority. They want to see hearts changed, first and foremost, not changed laws. And if they were going to be imprisoned about anything, well, they wanted it to be for preaching Jesus. They wanted it to be about preaching the one who has actually overthrown slavery to sin and slavery to death and, and to, to hell. But that's not to say that they were unconcerned about slavery. The second point here. The New Testament still does quietly subvert the whole idea of slavery. Like in Colossians chapter 3, we saw this a number of weeks ago here. It speaks about the equality of all people there. Uh, Here we go, Colossians 3. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian. Here it is. There's not even slave and free, but Christ is all and in all, right? So this equality of all people is foundational to the Christian message and is already starting to subvert this whole idea of, of slavery. Uh, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, Paul writes there, you know, gain your freedom if you can. Were you called as a believer while a slave? It should not be a concern to you, but if you can, become free. By all means... Uh, oh, sorry, if you, but if you can become free, by all means, take the opportunity. Uh, third point, uh, slave trading is a sin. We see that 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, fourthly, we've also seen in Colossians chapter 4 a number of weeks ago, Christian masters, if they're going to have slaves, well, they ought to treat their slaves well, treat them with dignity. Uh, that's another thing. So we can also see this foundation is certainly there in the Bible, and In time, who was it that worked tirelessly for the abolition of slavery? Christians. No wonder. It was all stemming from the Bible. Uh, Fifthly, uh, we mustn't think that slavery back then was the, 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 the slavery of the 18th century, the slave trade that we may immediately think of, right? The in in the Roman Empire, slaves accounted for a massive chunk of society. Some have said actually you know, a third of all society were slaves and another third were former slaves. Uh, it was a social structure that was happening at the time. And sure, some were treated terribly and that was just not on. But it wasn't all bad. Like many, many labourers, cooks, teachers, uh, many slaves had very significant responsibilities in management. They were provided with homes and food for their family. It wasn't all necessarily bad. Of course, if you have the opportunity, get out of it, as Paul says. But let's just separate what we might think of in Hollywood from the 18th century with uh, slavery back then. But what we've got to note from Philemon is this. The scandal here is not that Philemon was a slave master. The scandal was that Philemon should welcome his slave back as a brother. That's the scandal. So with all that in mind, what does Paul write to Philemon? Well, he begins with a prayer. See verse 4 there? Keep your Bibles open, your phone, uh, your book, Bible. Verse 4, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers, Philemon. 
because I hear of your love and faith toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Now, does that sound familiar if you've been with us for the last couple of months? It's just like that prayer that Paul had for the Colossians back in chapter 1 of Colossians. See, the very thing that the Colossians were known for, the Colossian Christians, they were known for their faith. They were known for their love for one another. And here Philemon is, he is leading the way in modeling that very thing. Remember, this is the beautiful thing of the gospel. That by faith in Jesus Christ, you enter not just into a remarkable new relationship with God, but also into new relationship with fellow believers. We become family, brothers, sisters in Christ with God as our father, our communal father. And Philemon, he gets this. I mean, just look down at verse 7. See what Paul writes there and is thankful for about there in verse 7. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love, Philemon. Because the hearts of the saints, remember that word saint, this is talking about fellow Christians. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. What brings you refreshment? You know, is is it it these things? Is it a swim at the beach in summer? Is that what gives you refreshment? Maybe you're a crazy person and you love the, the swim in the winter. Is this kind of your sort of story? Is this what you find a refreshment? You love a cold dip. Uh, do you find the hot cup of tea? Is that refreshing? Or maybe you prefer the, the iced tea. Is that the refreshing thing for you? We all know what it is to be refreshed. We love that refreshing, ah, re-energizing feeling. And yet, this is what Philemon's love was like. This is what his encouragement to others to keep following Jesus, that's what it was like. You know, I wonder what would happen if we all sort of woke up on a Sunday morning or whatever a day of the week that your hope group or such is on, and we asked ourselves this question, how can I refresh the hearts of my brothers and sisters in Christ today? Wouldn't that be a great question? How can I refresh the hearts of of my brothers and sisters in Christ today. Wouldn't that just transform how we think about one another if we ask that question of ourselves? And by the way, like if you're you're sitting there going, I'm just finding life really hard at the moment and I've I've got nothing in the tank for refreshing other people. And I say, don't stop coming to church, right? Don't stop coming to your hope group, right? Your your presence, (laughs) that is a refreshment in and of itself. And... But keep coming to allow yourself to be refreshed by others. Keep allowing yourself to be refreshed by others. But this work of refreshment is what Paul wants Philemon to keep doing even more. Look at verse 6. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. Participation in the faith. Look, I'm really going to throw a Greek word into a sermon, but this is one of the, the one occasions that I will. Okay, here's the Greek word. It's called koinonia. It's this word for participation we just read there. It's also the word for partnership, fellowship, depending on how your Bible might translate it. But it's capturing all those sorts of ideas. So here Paul, he's praying for effective fellowship. So you know, right, when we're talking about Christian fellowship, we are not talking about having morning tea together. That's not fellowship, right? We're not talking about hanging out with your three best friends from church and say, oh, hey, why don't you come over for State of Origin night and we're going to have, have some great fellowship as we're watching the Biff on TV, right? No, no, that's, that's not Christian fellowship. Fellowship, partnership, it is how we participate in the faith that we share. It's how we express that we belong together, we're committed, invested in one another. It's how we live out that we are family. You see, this is what makes Christian fellowship remarkably different. Right? You can join Reesby Workers Club here and you can experience the point of difference. They say it right there. Uh, you can play soccer at this club here 
And you can discover the difference, whatever BBC, BBFC Soccer Club is. Uh, you can even get involved with Rotary International and you can help make a difference. All good things. They really are. But I tell you what, what we've got going on here, who we are together, as we participate in the faith, it's just something, something else, it's something out of this world. It's remarkable. It's, it's, it's powerful. Christian fellowship is powerful. But where does this power come from? What, what makes our fellowship effective? Look again, look again at verse 6. It's through knowing every good thing that is in us. And that's not kind of as if I've got some innate good in me. It's, it's knowing every good thing that God is doing, that God has united me with you and me and, and, and us with Christ. And he's filled us. He's filled us with faith and hope and love. And he's growing us. He's bearing fruit in us. And when we all know that, not just here, but when we know those wonderfully good things right here, that is what's going to make our, our fellowship effective. That's what's going to make it powerful because we'll start living it out together. That's what will make it effective, especially so when difficulty arises amongst us. And it will. Because you know what? Church isn't perfect. I'm sorry if you've come along and you've thought church is perfect. It really isn't. <laughs> uh, we're all still sinners. We'll still say things that we don't mean. Sometimes we may even say things that we do mean. (laughs) And that's not cool. We can hurt. We can get hurt. We can harbour bitterness. We'll sit in the left instead of the right or just not come altogether. We'll do all sorts of things, right? Sometimes we'll avoid a person just because it's it's too inconvenient to deal with them, right? Now... (laughs) I love our church, I really do. And I think we genuinely are a very welcoming and loving church. And I hear that time and time again. If you're joining us for the first time today, it's great to have you. I hope your experience really is one of a welcoming and loving church. I think that's true. But like Philemon and Onesimus and the Colossian church, our fellowship too, like any Christian church, is constantly being put to the test. Will we live out effectively what God has made us to be? Will we be shaped by the grace that God has poured into our hearts? So let's think about this fellowship at work through three people, Onesimus, Philemon, and Paul. Firstly, Onesimus, this runaway slave. And I can only imagine that when Paul said to him back in Rome, and Paul says, oh, look, I'm, I'm going to write this letter to the Colossians, and you know what? I'm going to write one about you, and I'm going to send you back with them. That would have been the absolute last thing in the world that Onesimus wanted to do, is to go back to Colossae, back to his master that he'd run away from. Because, uh, you know, going back, it's a risky business. Going back to, the, the, to, the, to your master is a risky business. I mean, this was the Roman Empire. And the Romans were absolutely obsessed with uh, making an example of runaway slaves, tracking them down, making an example of them. They could be whipped, branded, sometimes runaway slaves even killed. Would you take the risk in going back? But to make it even worse, look at verse 18. Paul writes there, and if, if... Onesimus has wronged you, Philemon, in any way, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. So it looks a fair bit like that Onesimus may have stolen from Philemon as he left. So this is a bit like taking yourself to the police station, knowing full well you'll be getting the penalty you deserve, walking right through those doors and saying, here I am, you know why I'm here. But Onesimus has not only broken the law, he's broken the relationship with his old slave master who is now a brother in Christ. So he's going back not just to right a wrong, but to right the relationship. He's going back to seek 
forgiveness. He's going back in repentance. And if you and I have been gripped by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we too must go back to situations and say, I'm sorry. Have you been gripped by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ? I remember a, um, a guy uh, that I was at church with once upon a time, uh, church will go, and uh, I always got strange vibes. I always got strange vibes from him, and I didn't, look, to be honest, I didn't find him particularly encouraging. And as things went on, things just got frostier and frostier. Now, did I want to address that? No way. Certainly did not. I did not want to address that whatsoever. Uh, Did I want to become vulnerable? Did I want to open myself up? No way. I found that to be a risky business. Okay? How was I going to do that? I tell you what, we caught up. We chatted. We had to clear up lots of stuff. We reconciled. We prayed together. Is there some risky repentance that you need to to be a part of? Is there someone at home, someone at church? Will you take that action to restore that relationship? It was risky for Onesimus to go back. It was also risky, scandalous even, for Philemon to welcome him back. Do you see what Paul urges him to do in verse 16? He urges him to receive Onesimus, here it is, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. And I reckon Philemon did. I mean, Paul, he was confident that he would. And again, I can imagine Philemon, he's down at the markets and he's there, he bumps into his other um, well-to-do mates and his friends hear about this and they say, you did what, Philemon? You did what? You didn't whip him? You didn't break his bones? Wait till the other slaves in your household get, get, get word of this. You're going to have some, you know, your hands full trying to deal with all these slaves thinking this is how you're going to do it. You're an idiot, Philemon. And then I can imagine one of his friends then saying, oh yeah, and by the way, Philemon, my, my wife, I, she was walking down past your place on Sunday morning and she saw you, Philemon, standing with that, that, that slave of yours talking and and singing to that that God of yours. What on earth has possessed you? Well, I wonder if Philemon would have said something like this. You know what's possessed me? The grace of God in Christ Jesus. That's what's possessed me. I wonder who God is calling you to accept back. Maybe someone's gossiped, said insensitive things, and it's hurt. And then at some point, you get that SMS from them and they want to chat, they want to catch up. The world says, cut them loose, make them pay, something else. But how about we allow Christian fellowship to show its true power? Yeah? And again, remember, I'm not talking about Tim Tams here over morning tea. <laughs> like, I know it can be hard. I know it can be uncomfortable. I know it may take time. But where there is truth and grace, there can be reconciliation if both sides are willing. Which does mean that sometimes reconciliation may not be possible. And in that case, all we can do is focus on our own heart of forgiveness. And by the way, none of this is saying that you're, you know, that, that, that you're meant to welcome someone back who is harmful or abusive without very clear and appropriate boundaries. This isn't saying be naive and go back to sort of unsafe situations. Not at all. But what we are talking about is that the gospel fundamentally redefines how we deal with, with one another. Because the gospel has fundamentally redefined how God has dealt with us. Now, next week, actually, we're going to be sharing together here in church the Lord's Supper, communion. 
And so how appropriate then it is for us to consider, do I need to reconcile with someone in the course of this next week? Do I need to commit that to prayer? Is there a brother or sister in Christ that I need to you know, approach so that next week we can together come in good conscience and share together in communion? I'll leave that with you. So we've looked at Anisimus, we've looked at Philemon, and we'll also see the fellowship at work through Paul, who was a model of gospel-shaped leadership. And do you notice there how gently persuasive Paul is? Because he could have pulled rank. And he kind of subtly mentions it too. Like, see there in verse 8? For this reason... Although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right. I'm, after all, Paul is an apostle. <laughs> he could have said so. What does he say instead? I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. And from the verses that follow, Paul really does try to be quite persuasive. Not because he's trying to uh, you know, twist Philemon's arm, but because he wants to, to, to seek and to win Philemon's heart. That's why he seeks to be persuasive. Because love does not say, just tell me, tell me what I have to do. Just give me the box to tick. Just, just tell me what I have to do to get that person off my back. That's not what love says. Love says, how can I see this person as a brother or sister in Christ? Love says, how has God so loved me? Paul wants Philemon to want to love. And he does so in a lovingly gentle way. But notice as well that Paul also models mediation. Paul, he uses his position of trust between both men to be a, a kind of go-between. It's like he says, you know, look Philemon, right? You guys, you guys Philemon are now brothers. Yeah? And like, let me help be involved in this. Like, if, if, there's, if money is an issue, if there's something that has been stolen or if it's something that is owing, let me pay for it. Let me cover it. Charge it to my account, says Paul. Do you see what Paul's doing there? Paul is mediating at his own personal cost. Now, that might start to ring some bells for us. It's as, almost as if Paul, he's got... One outstretched arm around the slave and the other outstretched arm around the master. And with those outstretched arms, he brings them together. Isn't that exactly what Jesus does at the cross? With, with one outstretched arm around us, the sinner, and another outstretched arm around his heavenly father, he, by his death on the cross, he, he brings us together. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at this. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sins against them. You see, this is the gospel that Jesus stands between us and God. You know, because we're all like Anisimus. We've run far, far away from our master. But at the cross, Jesus pays the price. He charges, gets charged to his account. He pays that price for our sin. Not because we deserve it. No way. What we deserve is punishment, like a runaway slave. But here's the scandalous thing. What does God show us instead? Grace. It's the scandal of grace. Giving what we do not deserve. And he gives us that in Jesus Christ. Friends, do you know what grace can mean for you? Forgiveness, your slate wiped clean forever. Freedom, no longer a slave to sin. Reconciliation, your relationship with God is made right, now part of his family. You see, no matter who you are, no matter what your story is, no matter where you've run to or how long you feel like you've been running, God has got his runaway grace for you. Friends, are you still running away from God's grace? 
Will you receive God's amazing grace today? Like, like Philemon, like Onesimus. Will you put your trust in Jesus today and what he's done at the cross in reconciling people to God? Will you do that like them? Maybe though you're someone who knows the grace of God, but in a sense you've been running away from offering it to someone in particular. Perhaps you've moved to church. Maybe you come here from another situation, another church. Perhaps you've moved congregation. Perhaps you've moved hope group to escape someone. Perhaps you've just moved one seat over. And as you look at the person next to you today, don't think too much about that. But has that been you? Maybe you felt that time would just bury it all. And you carry on. But then just a glimpse of that person and you know that those, that open wound is still there. As someone whose life has been changed by the grace of God, will you show grace to your brother or sister in Christ? Will you do whatever you can, at least, from your side, to reconcile? Will your participation, your fellowship in the faith, will it be effective to the glory of Christ? as we seek to live out the grace of God. Ah, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. Your amazing grace for us who have wandered far, run far away from you. And yet you love us still. You call us home. You welcome us home. You make us part of your family. We praise you for your amazing grace. Father, help us to be so gripped by your grace that we live it out, that you would transform us individually. You would transform our homes. You would transform our church, this fellowship, this partnership of, and community of believers here, united in Christ, to be something remarkable, something different as you have already made us to be. Help us to live out what you have done for us. Help us to be a forgiving fellowship that Christ might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.